Gracious Heavenly Father, I come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word. We give thanks to you, O Lord, for just who you are, everything that you do in our lives, everything that you're doing, you have done, are doing, and will do. We so, dear Lord, look forward to our blessed hope and we give thanks to you, dear Lord, for you keeping us and preserving us until that day. I just ask that you would filter out all the, the error, the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com and we're going to continue on in our study in 1st uh, Thessalonians. Uh, we're still at the end of chapter 4. I'm going to try to make a transition into chapter 5 in this video. Uh, the study through uh, this epistle has gone a little quicker than I thought. Of course, I have covered verses uh, rather quickly. Uh, uh, it's... Uh, it's always been my feeling that I never really do justice to the text. And so I, I hope that you all will forgive me for that. I, I do try to bring out as much as I can uh, from each one of these verses. Uh, there are times where I like to just kind of sort of hover over one verse or two and spend more time on it than I do others. But uh, I want to thank you all for your continued interest uh, as we study along in these verse-by-verse -verse studies. I've uh, uh, deliberately stopped shaving for a while, so if it looks like my face is a little, a little rough, uh, that's the reason. A super giant uh, star. Uh, what they say about super giants is that they destroy themselves in a huge explosion called a supernova. And the death of these massive stars can trigger the birth of other stars. Death precedes life. We know from nature and we also know from this book that a seed is alive. A seed is living. And all those seeds are, are dormant or, or they're, they're resting, their cells are still out, active and they're still alive. When it's planted, the seed dies and it brings forth fruit of its own kind. If you plant cucumbers, you get cucumbers. If you plant squash, you get squash and, and so on. In the same sense as the supernova, death precedes life. Jesus stated that the hour has come, this is John chapter 12, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat, and he's referring to himself, fall into the ground and die, it abides alone, but if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies, says Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. For this reason Christ died and returned to life so that He might be the Lord of both the dead and the living, Romans chapter 14. Death, folks, precedes life. We read in Ephesians chapter 2, we noted that when we studied through that chapter verse by verse, by verse and you were dead in trespasses and sins, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace we've been saved. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. Again, we see death precedes life. Now, I think this is relevant to our present study concerning those who have 
fallen asleep that God has put to sleep, as I pointed out in my previous video, that it's a passive voice. God put them to sleep. It's also a passive voice in, in reference to those who remain. We read, so then death works in us, but life in you, says Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, hello. Death works in us, life in you. Many of you understand that that, that realize that 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 reference, what Paul's referring to when he says death works in us, but life in you, is that it, it's the fulfillment of the reality of of God working in our lives what is true, and that is that we've died to sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and even death itself. That the surpassing greatness may be of God and not of ourselves. So death works in us and life in you. Now, that's interesting. We can, we can continue on uh, with this thought. Uh, Second, Second Corinthians chapter 4 uh, tells us that we who are alive are always consigned to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our mortal bodies. Death to self, where that Christ is manifest. Him, not us. Paul stated in Philippians chapter 3 that I may know Him, and Paul already knew Him as far as his is Christ being His Redeemer. He's talking about know in the experiential sense. We see that in the grammar, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. We also know from Paul that we, we've been crucified with Christ conformable unto His death. The outworking of that death to self, our being crucified with Christ, as he, as he talks about in Galatians, that it is no longer I but Christ who lives. If by any means, he says, I might attain, maybe I will, maybe I won't, that's a, a subjunctive mood of uncertainty, attain unto the out-resurrection. That is a very peculiar word. It's used only once there the out-resurrection of the dead. He's not referring to his body being raised. He's talking about resurrection life in his life there and now. In order that I might attain unto the, the resurrection of the dead. That walking in newness of life, his life. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also, he says in Romans, Chapter 7, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Folks, unless we've died to the law, we cannot bring forth fruit unto God. The text is clear on that. Death precedes life. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto or until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. First Thessalonians 4, 15. The dead in Christ will rise first. The dead will rise first. Death precedes life. So, stars, as far as, as these supernovas, death produces the same. Seeds produce the same as planted, but they die in order to, to produce a, a likeness of their kind. Original sin, Adam, Garden of Eden, uh, requiring redemption, uh, new life, you know, followed the death, the spiritual death, you know, total depravity, preceded regeneration. Again, we see death precedes life. Justification, our new birth, our being born from above, being born again, 
we see the same principle. Sanctification, our walk, we see the same principle. Transformation, the rapture of our bodies that we're looking at in this present text, where we are sown to be harvested. And so perhaps God is being consistent when it comes to order, the order and the arrangement of things. That's how I'm reading this text. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. So we'll always be with the Lord. Will always be with the Lord. Death not only precedes life, death results in life. It is necessary for life. Strange paradox, isn't it? That death is necessary for life. Our Lord said, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. John chapter 12. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel will save it. Mark chapter 8. So, when we read that the dead in Christ will rise first, I believe that we are seeing God being consistent when it comes to the matter of order and arrangement. First things first. It's just that simple. You know, the, that this principle of life out of death is seen. It's seen in, in original sin. It's seen in our Lord's death. It's seen in our death from sin as well as our death to sin, self, and the law. That's, that's quite the pattern, folks, okay? But to see this same principle at work in stars and in seeds which in nature which bring forth fruit as well as our being dead to the law in order to bring forth fruit, you know, then to see the dead being raised first before those that are alive, to me, is nothing short of amazing in my opinion. Even in this life, as saints who are alive from the dead because, because we've, we've been raised with Christ to walk in, in, in resurrection life, even now, as we await the rapture of the church, which Christ brought forth as a result of His death, burial, and resurrection, how could we view these verses in any other light? Now, it's true, and, and I must concede the fact, I, it is true that the Holy Spirit doesn't tell, He doesn't tell us why in these verses that the dead in Christ are raised first, but perhaps the, the reason that He didn't is because this principle of death preceding life is so plainly revealed in the Word of God as well as in nature, which He expects us to know. And all we have to do is connect the dots. Now, if you have a different interpretation on, on what that means, that the dead in Christ are raised first, uh, I'm not going to fault you for that. But I'm here to, to look at the text and explain it to the best of my ability, and I believe that that's what the text is teaching us. I, I think that's what the text is saying. You know, in this fallen world, this, in this fallen universe, stars give birth to stars, but even those stars will eventually die, as will that which, which seeds produce. Eventually, your corn, your squash, your tomatoes, and all that's going to die. You know, as will anything that's physically alive, that anything that it produces, it's going to die. But our new birth, folks, changed all of that. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
And we are said to either be in Christ or in Adam. And because our new birth changed all that, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. To say that the dead in Christ are raised first because they've got, well, they got six feet further to go just doesn't seem to satisfy my curiosity. Uh, one bit. Or that they're raised first sort of as a special act of, of favor because they died. Poor souls, they died, so God, I'm going to raise them first. When God shows no partiality. I explained in my last video how I believe that our death is the rapture. So given what I've shared with you here so far, it could very well be possible that this is what the words of the dead in Christ are raised first mean, but as but at just as death precedes life in both the physical as well as the spiritual realm, death necessitates resurrection for believers and non-believers alike. You know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord or not be present with the Lord. The wages of sin is death. The unbelieving, I don't, I don't believe that the unbelieving, they're not resurrected to life, but they are resurrected to face judgment resulting from the second death. These are those who gr grieve because they have no hope. I simply don't believe that there is any such thing as an intermediate state that, you know, between physical death and, and the rapture, uh, which is sort of a half heaven, you know, which is the, the rapture, which is the next event to occur on God's prophetic calendar. There certainly was in, in this life. Uh, being dead in, in trespasses and sins before our new birth to life. On the other hand, we were always His. We always belonged to Him. Chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. We were alienated from God in our minds, but we were always His. The Word is clear concerning the fact though dead in trespasses and sins, we were reconciled to God when, when, when you accepted Him, believed in Him, repented, no. When Christ died in your place. We were crucified with Christ. When He died, we died. Therefore, in truth, we were literally, actually, we were born crucified as well as born raised with Christ. We just didn't know it until this we as lost sheep were found. I want you to note what Scripture does not say as it, as it concerns the law. It doesn't say that we've died to the law in order that we might at some point down the road bear fruit unto God. You know, you die to the law today, maybe you'll bear fruit Tomorrow. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. Since we have, one thing follows the other in, in rapid succession, or in, a, in a, I would say in precise, immediate succession. Since we've died to the law, since we've died to the law, it's not a matter of should we. You know, it's not like, you know, I've had so many people tell me, Steve, you know, we really need to die to the law. If we just die to the law, you know, we've got to die to the law. Or we've got to die to sin. We just we but we've got to die. We got to put that old self to death, folks. The the word says, "Ye have died." Okay, that's what it says. The point I'm trying to make here is that for the Christian to be dead is to be alive. Okay, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Death results in life. The result of death is life. 
you know, originally we passed out of death into life, spiritually. There was no intermediate state, you know, uh, mentioned or spoken about or talked about when, when it says that we passed out of death uh, in, into life. There's no intermediate state there. You know, to leave one state is to enter another. Now, I do recognize the fact that the death of a supergiant star takes time to produce new stars. I, I, I concede to that, okay? And that the death of that seed that you put in the ground, it takes time for it to result uh, in, in something coming forth of, like, uh, of its own kind. That, that takes time and, and uh, for growth to appear. And that when we come to realize our having died to the law, there may be some interval between that moment and the time that we bear fruit unto God. However, we are clearly told that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And it was that same day that the thief, the penitent thief, thief on the cross was with our Lord in paradise. And I can't believe that he's with Christ in paradise now, you know, to be soon placed back in a tomb, to be raised again, along with those of us who remain alive to meet the Lord in, in air, as I explained in my last video. I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit wants us to realize the most important principle here, which is that which, which is... Uh, that which is that that which is alive does not precede that which is dead but that death always precedes life in a world corrupted by sin but we who are alive and remain are are not asleep in Christ when the when he returns and and because we never will be put to sleep by God it, it, would, it, would, it would make no sense for him to say that, that we will be raised first. Well, you living, you, guys, you, you folks that are living, you know, you know, you're going to be raised first, and then I'll raise those who I put to sleep. That, that wouldn't make any sense. At least in my opinion, that would not make any sense. Um. Uh, Death always precedes life. And, and so, we, we travel past this final verse of comfort in chapter 4 to chapter 5, knowing that there's no, there were no, tran, no, no uh, chapter divisions in the original text. We traverse over into chapter 5 knowing, knowing that there were no chapter divisions in the original text, okay? But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for you, yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So now we've left the rapture behind, we're going on into something else. Or, or are we? The day of the Lord cometh. You know, I think, I think that we need to realize that there are a great number of Christians who believe the return of the Lord is, is a single event. When most Christians I know, when they, if you confront them and you talk to them and ask them about the the, you know, the return of the Lord, they tend to look at that as one event. That He'll simply return someday you know, to the Mount of Olives to establish His kingdom on earth. And if you were to ask many of these, of these Christians if they believed that He could return at any time, you know, is, 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 is His return imminent? If you were to ask them that, and I'm talking about you know the majority, and I would I'm willing to suggest the majority. Okay. Uh, do you believe that he can come back at any time, or or do you believe that his rapture is intimate? Oh yeah, yeah, I believe that. 
So you believe that he can come at any time. Well, yeah, yeah, I do. I believe that. So you're pre-trib then. You believe the rapture is pre-trib. No. No, I, I don't believe that. No, I don't believe it's I don't believe in that nonsense. Oh, Darby started all that crap. I don't believe in that. No, I don't think is I don't I don't think there is such a thing as as as, as the rapture or I don't think there's anything uh, to I don't think that pre-trib, I mean, surely we've got to suffer just as long with everybody else. It's just not fair that they suffer and we don't. Listen to me, folks. I, I've done a number of videos on, on pre-trib, showing the proof for a pre-trib rapture, eliminating by process of elimination, showing how that none of the other views will, will stand up to the test of Scripture. But we see this among many many Christians. Now, what I would have to to say to these individuals is is, well, because now, now how can you believe? How can you believe the rapture is imminent and not believe in a pre-trib rapture? Because if there's only one return of the Lord who returns either within the tribulation period or at the end of the tribulation period. You'd be looking for the Antichrist. You'd, you'd be looking for times of difficulty and, and suffering. Therefore, you can't now say that it, He could return at any time. You don't really believe His, his coming is imminent. That's what I would have to say. Folks, I want you to take serious note. You know, look, you can't, you cannot now say that he could return at any time because these things would have to happen first. Folks, I want you to take serious note of the fact that in our present context here, at the end of chapter four, there's no mention of any of these things. None of these things. None of these things which we read in the Old Testament. In Zechariah and you know, and other Old Testament prophets about the coming of the Lord and how great a terrible day that's going to be. No mention of that by Paul here. None. None. Okay? And I, I want you to take serious note of that fact that in our present context here, at the end of this chapter, chapter 4, Paul doesn't mention any of that stuff. We are watching for the rapture. We are not told to watch for the Antichrist. No mention of apostasy here in this passage. Paul never refers to our seeing times of suffering and difficulty in relation to that period which we refer to as Daniel's 70th week. We see none of that here. There are two comings. The words, the day of the Lord, the, there in in the, at the beginning of chapter 5, is not referring to what we have been looking at here. Our blessed hope, the rapture. And as we move forward from the fourth chapter to the fifth, you'll find out that though reference is made to the time of Jacob's trouble, though reference is made to those who are walking in darkness, those who are of the night, not of the day, though reference is made there to those individuals and, and such things, that, that we are still looking at a pre-trib rapture at, at the beginning of chapter 5, well into, in fact, quite a few verses into chapter 5, we're still looking at the rapture, folks. A pre-trib rapture. The Holy Spirit has not changed His stream of thought here is what I'm, I'm really trying to... Trying to I'm, that's the point I'm trying to make. But of the times and the seasons. The word times there, folks, is the word chronos. Chronological time, the passing of time and the seasons. That's God's appointed times. Brethren, you have you have no need. Okay? You have no need. 
All right? I, I remind you, Revelation was written over 40 years later after, after the, the epistles to the Thessalonians, 40 to 45 years later. Uh, the Thessalonians was written in the 40s. The Revelation was written in the 90s. We're looking at 40 plus some odd years there. Four, and the word four there in the text, four. Here's why, okay? Because for the times and the seasons, you have no, but of the times and the seasons, you have no need that I write unto you. For, here's, here's the reason, that one word for, he's given us the reason, for, here's why, yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, and I remind you, over, there's over 90 references in the Old Testament alone associating that term, Day of the Lord, with a period that beginning with the tribulation period which extends throughout the kingdom age. Okay? The tribulation period, the return of Christ, the kingdom age, Day of the Lord. That's a long time if, when, you, when you add the kingdom age to that. That's the Day of the Lord. It is specifically referred to in the Old Testament, explained in the Old Testament as being that time period. Okay? So cometh as a thief in the night. There is no, there is no admonition given to the church to watch for such a time. For when they, okay, note the, the change in personal pronouns when they shall say, peace and safety. Okay? Not even they will be watching. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall what? Not, unlike us, they shall not escape. We will, they won't. Okay? The text is clear. There is no mid-trib or pre-wrath rapture inside Daniel's 70th week. No, no mid-trib, no post-trib, no partial-trib. You know, just the, the guy, only the... the the really good Christians that God really loves, they're, they're the ones that go. No pre-wrath. None, none of that. None of that. Folks, the text makes it clear. Okay, we're looking at that right here, right now. Okay? It is impossible to deal honest with, honestly with this text and not see that the rapture's pre-trib. Okay? There is no mid-trib pre-wrath, post-trib, partial-trib rapture inside Daniel's 70th week as so many who hate pre-trib claim. But ye brethren, verse 4, change of pronoun again, okay, are not in darkness that that day, that day, the day we just, I just spoke about, should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep. Let us not sleep. That's a command, okay? Don't sleep. God is commanding us not to sleep. Well, we know right away from that, that sleep here does not mean death as we saw in chapter uh, 4, verses 13, 14, 15. But as it's, it's like Ephesians chapter 5, 14 says, Wherefore, he says, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. That's talking about your life right now. Okay? What, a, what an amazing parallel. Okay? Pattern, if you will. However you want to put it. 
It's talking about your present life. Same reality, different time. Okay? We see that a lot in Scripture. What reflects the present is seen in, in the future. What, what we see reflected in eternity is also seen reflected in time. It's, we see that a lot. And so we are children of the light. So it's a command. Okay, God would not be commanding us not to die as do others. Are you following me? Okay. But let us watch and be sober. Sober. The word there, that is, that is having a presence of mind. It's having clear judgment is what the word indicates. It's not, to, it literally means don't be intoxicated, but, but, but it's to, it means to have a presence of mind. Sober, which is the opposite of being irrational. That's what the word means. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation, deliverance. He has... He hasn't, the Holy Spirit has not left the subject of the rapture here, folks. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation, deliverance. It's not salvation in the sense that the word is commonly used, thrown around, tossed around, thrown around today. Uh, salvation means being born again. It's deliverance. The word is sozo. The word is deliverance. And in this particular context, it's, it's speaking of our being delivered from this body of sin and, and, it, and from this world of sin and death. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that in order that, now listen close, Okay, the Holy Spirit, folks, is he, right here is telling you and me there's a reason why He died for us. He, there's a reason why. Here's the reason why He died in our place. Okay, okay. Oh, well, Steve, I know why He died in my place. He died in my place so that I might be able to, you know, if if I so will it, or decide or choose, you know, become a child of God. Listen, folks, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Well, that's talking about whether we're in the grave or on below, below the ground or, or above the ground, we'll live together with Him. That's what that's saying. And that is not what that is saying, in my opinion. Okay? It's not saying that whether we're asleep in Christ or that we remain that we should live together with Him. That's not what it's saying. Okay? The context is... His, listen, His death in our place puts to rest any thought whatsoever that our deliverance in this context, the rapture, okay, is in any way based on human merit. Okay? that we're only raptured if we've been faithful. Folks, you're raptured because He's faithful. Well, I'm only raptured if I love Him. No, you're raptured because He loves you. Oh, Steve, Steve, that can't be true. I'm only raptured if I just do the best I can. You've died to the law in order that you might bear fruit unto God. Dearly beloved, what a comfort. It's no wonder that we're... we're we're given such comfort here. His death in our place puts to rest any thought whatsoever concerning human merit. And that in relationship to our justification, our sanctification, our glorification, our redemption, our transformation. Okay? 
It's all based upon what Christ did, not what we do. It's all based on His, His faithfulness, not our own, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. Well, no wonder. No wonder we're to comfort ourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. This is, folks, this is what we do. It's what the new man does. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I want to take a moment to thank you all for your continued prayers and your continued support and your continued interest in these studies. And I ask you now to take a moment to pray for those whom you've never met. To take a moment to pray for those who have followed this channel, who have messaged me with prayer requests for loved ones who are sick and for difficulties that they're going through. We are certainly living in perilous times. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.